So, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the second uh, Odyssey Australia webinar. This afternoon, um, we have Dougie Boyle and Nicole Pratt um, to discuss the transformational data collaboration supporting the uplift of clinical data sets for research in Australia. Um, they'll be focusing on data quality, data quality assessment tools, terminology mappings, and the adoption of common data models. Um, we'll have 10 minutes for questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, and please note the session will be recorded. And sorry, I, I forgot to introduce myself. My name's Roger Ward and I work at the University of Melbourne and I'll be moderating this afternoon's session. Um, so over to you, Dougie. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. Well, it's fantastic uh, to be able to uh, present what we've been doing. Uh, I think we're, can everyone mute them, please? Um, I'll mute all. Um, yeah, it's fantastic to be able to uh, present the work that we've been doing in the transformational data. Oh, to it. And um, what, where this came from is for many years I've been working in health data science and trying to um, bring sense to the, the morass that is, is data in Australia, but also internationally is, is a real challenge. Um, and in Australia, we in particular have quite a competitive way of working and the, the funding models are quite competitive in research. And that sometimes makes it difficult to try and do things at a national level. Um, so really the starting point is, wouldn't it be nice if we could do something very, what seems simple, which is take information about people, what happens to them, and have some standard sort of governance, but basically allow the ability to allow research to happen through things like cohort selection and doing predictive algorithms and so on, and producing research output. Of course, we, really, we all know that things are so much harder than that. And the human condition is very complex. Um, we're analog, we're not digital. Um, we don't necessarily have fixed things go wrong with us. We, we have, we're along a spectrum of, of disease or things that happen to our bodies. Um, so really it is, is very difficult and it's taken the, the, the computing world many years to try and um, come up with mechanisms to make sense of this. But still we find electronic medical records are um, in some cases fairly simple, but more generally they're very complex. And this makes it very difficult to use uh, this sort of data directly for research. And bear in mind that an awful lot of researchers in the health domain are clinicians. Um, people with a background in treating people, not necessarily people that understand the data and data science. And internationally, there are um, lots of standards now for health data interchange. Um, and this is making a huge difference in terms of real time ability to move data around. Again, these messages are very complex. Um, we've got complex administrative data sources as well. Um, that are used for the purposes in hospital, things like billing, but also for government reporting. And some of the challenges with sources of data like that are whether data can actually be released. Can governments give data out and under what conditions? And last but most certainly not least, um, there's a huge amount of data, of course, that's collected through, the, through clinical trials. And it's collected often in um, bespoke or um, industry standard tools for clinical trials data management and this sort of data is um, highly characterized but often for small patient numbers um, and um, what is kind of interesting in this space is that if you actually want FDA approval for uh, for a drug something like that as a result of a trial then you're obliged to convert your data to the CDISC SDTM standard. Um, so that's just an interesting thing to note for later on um, as I talk about how we can bring things together. So really what we're actually needing is um, in simplistic terms to be able to pull all this stuff together. But is it simplistic? No. So everyone I think probably in um, the webinar today I'm sure has some 
uh, knowledge of Odyssey. And um, it certainly aims to achieve some of the standardization and the ability to reuse data that we might look for. So it gives us an ability to have data from different sources and different formats. And if you're clever enough, you can transform that into the standard model. And it means that you can run the same analysis across different databases that have been converted to get standard results out at the end. So this, for me, um, when I first became aware of this, was, was a bit of a revelation. Um, but I couldn't see how we could actually implement something like this, except for on an ad hoc basis in Australia. Why did I get interested in this one in particular? Well, there are, of course, other um, common data models out there, but we, we had a look at this, did some analysis, and uh, certainly the OMOP uh, common data model is one of the most widely used, and in terms of its ability to record medical information, it is definitely one of the best. Um, there are other, other attributes, like the tool sets are available and the fact that it's open source. Uh, so there is a huge community out there contributing into the OMOP CDM and it's always evolving. So um, these are just some of the tools that are available in open source uh, for people to take data in its original form in red and ultimately convert it into this common standard in green. Um, the system also helps um, with terminology mapping. So um, OMOP is, is ultimately an American invention, um, but we can actually convert our Australian data like PBS codes to AMT to RX norms so that we can standardize with the way people are representing the data internationally. Once you have the data in the OMOP common data model, this is when it starts to make some sense to health professionals. They understand the concept of the person, they understand the concept of people having visits or episodes of care, and then they can understand what happens within those episodes of care in terms of things like uh, drugs that people are taking, measurements that have been undertaken. And the model also includes the ability to look at health economics, and the, vac the standard vocabularies are a key component. Um, over the last few years, um, frameworks for the assessment of quality have been evolving. One of the most widely used one is CAN, and I'm not sure if Teng Lau is in the audience. Oh, he is. I can see Teng's here. So Teng uh, has been involved um, in the original research around this um, data quality assessment framework, and it's fantastic that we've got someone so experienced that's, that's part of our um, community here in Australia. Um, so one of the interesting things about the OMOP model is that it automatically gives you um, an assessment of your data, or at least it can do, um, uh, once your data is in this format. Where things get more exciting though is when you actually are able to use data in this format. And the really amazing thing are the number of tools that are being developed in our open source community for doing all sorts of things. And if you look at even government data, administrative data, there's always a challenge even in that in trying to standardize data and seeing what tools are available for doing um, research or audit or surveillance. Well, if your data is in this model, you can use all of these tools. But more importantly, when you run a query against this sort of data, it just gives you the results back. So you don't necessarily need to share um, all of this medical data externally. Um, by converting to this model, um, you're actually able to just run queries and provide results back, which can make a huge difference, um, in my view, in the future in terms of governments and the ability for governments, as well as health organizations, to be able to participate and have the data used for research. Um, the tools, um, really are impressive. And this is an example of um, some research that Nicole was involved in. And straight out of the box, you can do data visualizations like this. So 
again, the, the challenge though is uh, there might be somebody out there thinking, all right, well, look, I'm really not interested in this OMOP common data model. I'm interested in maybe Sentinel or, I, or the people I work with use Sentinel. So why should Australia, um, why would we want to promote using this um, in our Australian community? Well, I think, first of all, it, um, it is um, one of the most advanced in terms of how, uh, how it is used. But the other thing is that because there are a fairly small number of you know, large common data models being used internationally, already groups are looking to see how you can map across them. So just because we might choose to standardize on OMOP doesn't mean to say that in the future we can't have compatibility with I2, B2, Sentinel, and so on. So it's very exciting that the communities internationally are so large that this sort of stuff is happening now. And in terms of clinical trials data, if, if you have to submit your data to the FDA, if you've had to get your trials data standardized, there's already a group here that has looked at how you map clinical trials data to OMOP. Now, what does that mean? Well, this for me is very exciting. If you do your clinical trial, it's always in a very controlled situation. It's not real world. But if you map your data to OMOP, you can then actually do a direct comparison of your clinical trials output um, with real world data out there in terms of tens and hundreds of millions of patients worldwide. So this really is, uh, is a remarkable thing, which is, is, which is here for the future, in my view, is, is that real ability uh, to uh, validate trials data in the real world and to do that very fast. Um, in terms of clinical communication and standards, um, there are lots of them. So people sometimes say to me, why don't we just use the data in something like HL7 different formats and things. And this is an example um, of the way data is structured, often in things like My Health Record. Um, FIRE, in Australia we've invested heavily in FIRE as a mechanism for um, data communication. But you can see here that it is complex. I mean, people, um, you know, whole careers are based on trying to understand this. Um, so it is good for clinical data sharing, but you wouldn't want a researcher to have to try and make sense of this. But again, because of the size of the international community, there are people working in this space. Uh, so there's a, a group in the States who are already have operational, you know, certainly it's, it's still a research phase, but they have got operational OMOP CDM data repository. And what they're looking at is being able to do bi-directional flows for fire data so that you can consume data, for instance, from electronic health records direct into an OMOP CDM data repository that you can then use for research. So hugely exciting. So the, the I, I was aware of many of these things, but again, how do you actually try to get national collaboration? How do you really um, make things take off? How do you get people around the same table? Well, um, a fairly new organization um, is the Australian Health Research Alliance. And this, the, the Australian Health Research Alliance is funded through the Medical Research Futures Fund. And what it does is it brings together the advanced health research translation centers nationally, and also the centers for innovation in rural health. And, the significance of that is that ARA represents almost all academic research institutions and teams across the country, 95%, and also represents 78% of all acute services. So this is huge, you know, so when I first saw this, I was thinking, well, does that mean that we've got some possibility to do collaboration? And the key thing about ARA is that the MRFF funding which has gone to allow this collaboration to happen is about doing things open for the country. So it's not about myself in Melbourne um, trying to leverage this for Melbourne University research. It's about 
working with all of the, the translation centers and places like CSIRO, Digital Health Agency, to advance our common goals. So um, last year I was very privileged. We, we had um, um, a workshop in Sydney uh, where the uh, Data Driven Healthcare um, Improvement Committee and members um, got together to try and see what can we advance, what can we, we use this platform for? And um, we were able to, I was able to propose the transformational data collaboration. And really it was these ideas around trying to get data into common standards and dealing with quality um, and making it easier for people that I felt wasn't being otherwise addressed um, in an open way across the country. And there was a real opportunity to achieve that. Um, I'm not going to go into all of this structure in any detail, except for to say that ultimately this reports back to the Australian Health Research Alliance Council. Um, and that means that we are obliged across all of the work we do in the transformation of data collaboration to ensure everything is done in an open collaborative way and it's for the country. So that's really, really exciting. Um, it's not been going that long. We've, the first meeting was October last year and uh, quite a few of the people who were at that first meeting are actually online today. So that's very exciting to see um, everyone along today. And essentially what we did is we held some breakout sessions really to start thinking about data and quality and standards. Um, and Nicole was facilitating one of those around the common data models. Um, David Bunker, who's now the CEO of Brisbane Diamantina Partners and was very much involved in a lot of the development of My Health Record before it was called that, um, it was there and was leading up one of the work streams. And you can see in the picture um, in the far right there, there's Teng Liao and uh, there's a few other faces that uh, I recognise there that will be along here today. So the three work streams, so the first one on data quality assessment is being led up by uh, Daniel Capuro um, from University of Melbourne. Um, and then in terms of how we can uh, maximize the ability to use terminology standards and Australian terminologies, that's been led up by David Bunker in Brisbane. And the common data models is being led by Nicole Pratt at the University of South Australia. Um, but the thing about these streams is that it's not just about work activities going on at these three institutions. Um, this is an open collaboration and there's quite a number of people working uh, nationally uh, towards um, these work stream aims. Uh, so our first work stream on uh, data quality, I just want to give you an example here because if you're familiar with um, Odyssey and OMOP, you'll be familiar with tools like Achilles that already allow you to assess data quality. So maybe you're thinking, well, why do we need more work in this space? So what we're seeing here is this is a, an example, a screenshot from a GP computer system. And there are two buttons on the screen that the GP can click on that are quite close to each other. One's called reason and one's procedure. And if you click on these, that you get screens that are very similar. So it's actually very, it's very easy to make a mistake and pick the wrong button. And then um, if you look at data that's been recorded in the underlying database for this particular system, um, there's a couple of things which are interesting here. Here, there's a record of a, a visit date, a consultation in effect on the 21st, 21st of November. And if, if you're just a data analyst using this data, you can see also in another, another table is a diagnosis date with nausea, which interestingly is being diagnosed as a, well, a diagnosis and a procedure. But that is not the same date as this visit date. So you, you would be forgiven for thinking that this diagnosis actually happened on a different day from this visit. But that's not actually the case. So what actually happened is that this GP um, went and conducted a home visit. So the actual diagnosis information was typed into the computer the day after the visit, but it actually relates to this visit date. And here we can see some real world problems in that um, rather than nausea being recorded 
um, as a diagnosis, it's down here as a procedure. Now, if you just look at the typical sort of quality metrics that you get out of um, uh, things like Achilles, you wouldn't be able to get that richness of information about the things that can go wrong with this particular data source. And this is where I think we've got a gap and that we're really keen to explore this further. So we want to build on the CAN framework that's already there. Um, and we want to be able to have some visual displays. We want to be able to do things that people can relate to. We want to be able to find problems with data and make it easy for people to understand what they are, or not problems, but limitations. We did some work um, uh, about 18 months ago um, to try and advance parts of the CAN framework in this sort of space. And now what we're looking to do is to experiment with um, using things like the quality improvement um, performance incentive payments that are coming along for our general practice to explore um, how we would interpret the QI PIP um, in terms of um, really detailed information from these records. And this is just an example of us recording a lot more detail than you might find just in normal metrics. So what we've done is we've taken in the original GP electronic health record system data, as well as the definitions for QI PIP. And we've had a, a look at these and we've compared the data elements that are coming into real data that we've extracted in our electronic practice space network here in um, Melbourne. And we've used all of these different attributes to try and feed into our design and the workflow for what we're trying to achieve. Now, one of the things is anytime you transform data, um, you are building in different assumptions. So what we're trying to do is build something that allows someone to quantify aspects of the quality of their data at different parts of the journey. And we want this tool to work not just with OMOP, but actually what we want to try and do is build a standards-based tool that is going to be open source that would allow people to assess the quality of their data in a standard way, but they don't need to convert to OMOP, so it could be used for anything. That's really the plan here. Um, so we can have different data sets, different attributes, and different metrics all being made available by the tool. And um, our end game here is with the OMOP model, what we would love to be able to see is when you're actually analyzing, when you're looking through data as a researcher, we'd like you to be able to click on a data point and it automatically can bring you back into this online web tool and will actually tell you, for instance, why um, not, not just the fact that there are holes in your data, but actually based on knowledge that is also gathered, why there might be holes. So an example is, um, well, I know one of the general practice computer systems um, had an issue with importing structured data at one point from PathLab results. So there was so often in the GP records, there's a, there's a month where you can't see any data. So the question is, why is that data missing? Well, if we've, if we've actually recorded it well here, and the researchers can, can be able to find that out immediately. Um, but they can also then analyze lots of other attributes. So they can say, all right, I need these different fields. I need, need these different concepts to answer my research question. And what they were able to do is then look immediately at the points of failure or the points where there are issues identified uh, so they can de de determine, can I truly answer this research question? Um, so in terms of the terminology mappings, we're very fortunate in Australia to um, have a fantastic tool that's been developed by the Digital Health Agency. Um, and this tool, Onto Server, um, is primarily has been primarily put together to allow um, the Australian implementation of some SNOMED clinical terms to be released um, out to vendors that want to use SNOMED CT. Um, and what it means is that this onto server is well designed to be able to allow people to consume terminologies and mappings. Now. One of the problems with um, 
doing terminology conversions for custom data sets. So if, you're, if you've got a, a database where um, the clinical concepts have just, someone's just come up with their own model, um, you, it can often be very proprietary about how that then is converted to something like SNOMED clinical terms uh, for use. And what it is leading to, there are a lot of silos, you're getting a lot of people redoing the same work. Um, and what we want to do here is to build an onto server and to try and build a governed but potentially open model where people can share their terminologies. Um, and what we want to do is help integrate that then into, into the OMOP workflow. Um, and um, I've just got some, a, a very simple example here. Um, we've got an example of a concept from best practice, which is GP system with Meteor, which is a uh, standard used by Australian government, AIHW. And what's happening here is we're, we're taking best practice and Meteor concepts and mapping them to OMOP. And I've just got a couple more um, examples here doing the same sort of thing. So the, the real potential here is um, we could systematically map Meteor to OMOP. And then immediately all the open source tools and everything that allow people to analyze this data is available on that government data. And what it also means then is that people could submit queries to run on this and get the results back without having to go through um, all the issues and often uh, very uh, long time delays that might happen to get permissions for release of data. Um, the last work stream then, um, which is actually about advancing the common data model. Um, Australia didn't actually have an Australia, it, it, its own chapter of Odyssey. There were people working in this area, but because we have a national, um, a national collaboration now, we were able to apply to Odyssey. And in January of this year, we were recognized as um, having our own chapter. Uh, so this is very exciting. So this is the really the first big uh, win of our collaboration is to be able to have this established um, and for us to be able to now work nationally um, to ensure things like concepts like um, Aboriginal Tor Torres Strait Islander status are recognised as part of the international standard. So this really is now our hook in to the international community. So it's really exciting. And what we really want to do over the next uh, uh, year or so um, and ongoing is to see how we can advance mapping many of our major systems. Um, so EPIC, Cerner, primary care systems, government data, even clinical trials data. It would be wonderful if we can advance our ability to do that in Australia. And this doesn't mean that the transformation of data collaboration will do all of these mappings. What we see the collaboration is about is helping promote and make it easier for people to do these, these things. So some of this might be done through research organizations, through the HRTCs, or it could be done by contracting out to commercial companies that have got experience in doing this sort of work. So I'll leave it there um, and um, I'll uh, now hand over to Nicole. You just give me a moment, Nicole. Uh, you should now have control. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you everybody. Um, you can hear me okay, Dougie? Yep. Yep, excellent. Um, well, thank you again um, for that really great introduction. So uh, Dougie's talked a lot about um, you know, the mapping in Australia and the fact that um, the OMOP CDM is one of those vehicles for mapping uh, data in Australia and uh, internationally. Um, and I guess what I want to do here is really just highlight to you what's the point of doing uh, all of this mapping um, and what, what can it do for you. Um, and really for me as a statistician uh, and as you know, a health um, worker, I really want to get evidence out of that data the purpose of translating and going to all that effort um, to translate our data into a CDM is really to produce robust, 
reliable evidence that can inform clinical practice, um, that can inform policy, um, and that can help patients really is the, is the bottom line. Um, just trying to forward the slides. Once it works, you'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, it just takes a moment. Nope, not working, Dougie. Maybe I can just ask you to forward. Okay. Oh, hang on. Sorry, apologies. Waiting for Nicole. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll... Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we did practice this and it worked. So um, we've seen this before. So what is the mission uh, of Odyssey? It's really to generate... Um, evidence that can promote better health care um, and the vision is to create a world where that can happen and um, that we can get an understanding of health and disease and in particular get a comprehensive understanding of the disease. Um, next. Do you, want, yep. do you want to try just one last time then? I'll... I will. Yay, oh, there we go. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay and you, you've seen um, this schematic um, many times, but it really is critically important um, to what I'm going to show in the next slides. And it's about doing the conversion um, to a common data model. And the, the beauty of that is that we have this suite of tools, these analysis methods um, available to us, or we can create our own. There's absolutely no reason um, why you can't uh, do your own analytic tool um, and apply that to the OMUP CDM and then produce um, those results. And again, because we have that data uh, in, a, in a CDM, that means we have a whole range of approaches to doing studies. So we can do a single study, um, we can write a protocol, we have a question, we write a protocol, we develop some code, we execute the analysis and we get a result. Um, and that's fine, we can do that. In a, in a database, um, or we can develop real-time queries. Um, we can develop an app to run the, the jobs and then view the results all in real time. Or as I'm going to show you, um, we can actually scale up uh, analytics and do um, multiple studies across multiple databases um, and produce multiple results and explore those results. Um, and that's really the beauty, I think, of um, an OMOP CDM or any CDM really, is that we have this ability to scale up. Um, and as you'll know, and that's become critically important uh, since COVID. So with that ability um, to generate you know, large scale um, analytics comes some dangers and we really need some safeguards uh, in place so that the evidence that we generate is robust, um, is reliable and has that quality um, to inform uh, medical decision making. So here's a, um, a picture at Martin Schumi, who's a researcher uh, in the Odyssey community. Uh, he did a, a literature review uh, using PubMed and he extracted 60,000 estimates um, from the literature and plotted them uh, in, this, in this graph. And if I can orient you to um, here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, um, but at um, an estimate of one, which is uh, no um, difference. And in the um, green line here are estimates in the literature which are not significant. Um, you can see that there's a suspicious um, dark sort of um, line here where we've got small effect sizes that are significant. Um, and this is what we really need to worry about um, when we're doing observational research in any data, um, let alone in an OMOP CDM instance. Um, but we need to worry about p-hacking and publication bias. Um, we really need to be aware that a single study um, is not always the most robust evidence and we need to generate uh, those studies across multiple databases um, to ensure that we have generalizability. So this is a um, research initiative that Odyssey um, has led, and it really aims um, to put in those safeguards against how we create um, evidence from observational studies so that it is robust and it is reliable. 
Um, so Legend uh, is, its, is its title, um, Large Scale Evidence Generation and Evaluation Across a Network of Databases. So Legend really um, is an initiative where we've put guiding principles around how we generate and how we disseminate evidence to inform medical decision making. Um, we have some principles. The first one is to compare all treatments for a disease, many outcomes, and then we publish them all and that prevents publication bias. Um, we use a pre-specified and a systematic approach and that avoids um, p-hacking where we keep doing a study until we find um, a significant result. We use the best practice statistical methods to address measured confounding. Um, and as Dougie mentioned, you know, we go to all this effort to make sure our data are you know, quality, um, we have it in a, in a format and, and we've um, translated it all. Now we need to have really quality methods um, to generate evidence from that data. We use control questions where we know what the answer is um, to look for potential residual bias. Um, we expect to get a certain result and using our methods, do we actually get that um, result we're expecting? If not, we can um, do p-value calibration or confidence interval calibration to adjust for that bias. Um, we want to generate the evidence in a network of database, da databases so we can assess consistency. And lastly, we want to make sure that's all open. It's all shared. The analytics, um, the code is shared to enhance transparency and reduce producibility, but we don't share patient level information. And I think that's critically um, important in the use of the OMOP CDM is that it really does ensure patient level um, privacy. No data is ever um, removed or, or taken outside of the firewall for the data custodian, um, but analytic software can be written um, and run against an OMOP CDM without a researcher ever seeing that um, identified patient level information. Um, and if anyone's interested, um, we have two pa papers coming out around these principles of large scale evidence generation that are coming out in JAMIA um, in 2000, and so in the next couple of months. So um, here is sort of a schema of how we envision um, these data uh, to be generated. Um, it's a very complex um, diagram, so I won't go through it, but really it highlights all of the principles um, I was mentioning where we define our research questions out up front. We define what our treatments are. We define what our outcomes are. Um, we use negative controls and positive controls. We estimate causal effects using um, standard and best practice analytical um, methodologies. Um, and then we produce all of the estimates and they become available um, to uh, disseminate. Uh, so we were talking a lot about common data models um, and that was for the actual data itself, but you can also have a common data model for the results. Um, and as part of this legend study, um, there was you know, a formation of a common result data model um, where we have all of the study specifications, so we know what the indications were, what analyses were done, what exposures were um, tested and what outcomes were investigated. Um, we have metadata for who's in the database, what database was there. Um, it's all specified and all available. Um, and it, it does safeguard against um, those questions about what is the provenance of, of the data and where has it come from? Who does it include? Um, you know, what data, um, or data dates does it include, that type of thing. And then we have the results. So all of the results are available, all of the um, artifacts of the analysis itself, what's the relative risk, what's the confidence interval, and so on. And then importantly, the analytic diagnostics. And this is a really important thing because now we can publish all of those um, you know, investigations into the methodology and to the results and say, are we confident uh, in the results we have? Does the covariates pass, uh, covariates pass the balance test? Are our two treatment groups balanced after we adjust um, for the propensity score, for example? So it's really important that we are open and we are transparent, not only in the data that we use, but in the results that we generate um, and the um, confidence we have 
in those results. Um, and that all comes together to really um, uplift the evidence that we can create from observational data sets. Um, as I mentioned, we have a common data model for the results. And that means, of course, that we can explore those results and we can um, have, a, have a shiny app where we can go in deep and investigate a particular outcome, a particular exposure and a different data set um, and so on. And all of this uh, is available for anybody um, who's interested um, to look at. And you will have remembered um, the graph I showed you before where we had a really um, suspicious uh, dark area down here where there were small effect sizes um, and significant results. When we do our legend and apply the principles of, of legend, we actually come up with a much more realistic um, estimates of our analysis. We get much more um, small non-significant results. Um, we are 83.4% of the confidence intervals include one. Um, it's much more normally um, what we expect when we do large scale. Okay, so that brings us to coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, and what I've taken you through there is really just showing how the setup of Odyssey, how you can have your data in an OMOP CDM, you can have your data checked for quality, um, you can have all of the analytic tools available to you, and COVID-19 hits, and we're in a great position um, to actually generate evidence rapidly um, and robustly so that we can really inform um, medical decision making. Um, so the, again, this is exactly um, what I just mentioned. We have Odyssey, we have the mission, which was to promote better healthcare um, collaboratively um, and to create a comprehensive understanding of health and disease. And we can do that for COVID. And actually that happened. Um, and I'm sure many of you that are on this call may have attended um, the COVID-19 study -thon that Odyssey held in March um, of this year. So uh, there was uh, meant to be a European symposium and of course um, that was not able to go ahead because of COVID-19. Um, so quite rapidly they changed that into a study -thon, an online study -thon, where the community got together um, and there was probably over 400 um, participants that actually signed up and participated in the study -thon, uh, over that four day period of the weekend of, of March 26. Um, and the community came together, they came up with questions, um, they came up with solutions, they came up with um, analytic code, and they run that on databases because those databases were available uh, and, and ready to go. Um, so Odyssey Australia was involved in a couple of different um, questions, and this is one that I was um, particularly involved in. And we asked the question, um, do ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE2s influence infection risk of coronavirus disease? Um, and the reason we did that particular question, because there was the, um, so people noted that those with hypertension were more likely to develop se severe complications of coronavirus, um, resulting in hospitalization and so on. Um, and that was thought to happen through the mechanism of how the SARS-CoV-2 enters human cells. Um, it binds to the membrane um, of, of ACE2. So it was identified that perhaps chronic exposure to um, RAS therapy or ACE2 um, may alter the expression. And there was some public health concern about that and people um, perhaps thinking maybe we should uh, stop treatment with these medications in case there is this increased um, risk of getting coronavirus in people who are on um, those medicines. So there was a really critical public health need um, to answer this particular question. So the Odyssey community came together um, and formed ICARIUS, um, which is the International COVID ACE Receptor Inhibition Utilization Safety Study. Um, so that all happened over that four day period. And it happened because, as I mentioned, the data sets were available. They'd been translated to the OMOP CDM. There were three um, that were involved in this particular study, one in New York, um, one in Spain, and the VA database in the US. 
And then we had the tools available. So the cohort method package was available and it was used. Um, we created the protocol um, from start to finish and that is in open source um, online that anybody can, can look at uh, and can comment on. Um, the packages were run across the data sets um, and all of the results are now um, available uh, and shared online. So we ended up um, with about 1,200 uh, study effects um, that were run across those three different uh, data sets to look at this question. Do ACE2 um, inhibitors have a um, effect in terms of COVID susceptibility compared to other antihypertensive medicines? Um, and then we generated the results. So you can see here that we've got three different databases and um, quite a number of patients in each of those data sets on the exposure medicine. So ACE and ARBs compared to um, calcium channel blockers or thiazides. Um, so that analysis was done within each data set for monotherapy, combination therapy, and then across um, uh, meta-analysis across all the data sets. Um, here's just some of the results. There's a lot, you can't see them, but in the end, we actually found no difference um, with the ACE2s compared to um, the CCBs and the thiazides. Um, and it really, you know, helped to um, understand that uh, association and to really highlight that the clinical societies um, that had, you know, um, sort of uh, wondering whether or not patients should uh, stay off these medicines um, really highlighted that you know patients should stay on their medicines um, and there was it didn't warrant um, patients um, discontinuing their ACEs or ARBs. Um, and again as I mentioned previously in our other study all of the results um, for the, the Icarus study are available online um, and you can log on to data.odyssey.org um, to see any of those results and, and play around um, with those results um, if you are so interested. Um, and there's many other studies there as well. And I'd encourage anybody um, who is interested in, in COVID-19 and, and medicines that um, are used um, to either treat or prevent um, COVID-19, that if you go to data.odyssey.org, um, you can really play all day in data. There's many, many um, projects there. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to show you that in um, the five or six or seven or weeks or so, um, there were many, many publications um, that came out of the study-a-thon. And Odyssey Australia um, was involved in these three different um, studies, which are now all on um, the Medrix um, uh, open source um, preprint uh, website. So you can go and, and look at all of these. So um, there may be other people online who um, were involved in some of the other studies as well. But here's the, um, the ACE study. Um, there was a large prediction study, an individual patient level prediction study that looked at your susceptibility um, for COVID and outcomes if you were um, to be infected with COVID. And, and also looking at the um, you know, external validation of those prediction models. So all of these studies are available uh, in COVID-19 updates um, website uh, and a really a good example of what can be done uh, with data and very quickly, very rapidly, uh, if we have our data available in an OMOP CDM. Um, and that's where I was gonna leave it and hand it back over to you, Roger. Thanks, Nicole. That was great. Uh, very interesting. Um, yeah, and thanks to Dougie as well. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit. Uh, I'll take questions in a second, but I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the next webinar we're doing. Um, we're inviting Mui Van Zant uh, from uh, Odyssey Asia Pacific uh, to talk about the practicalities of mapping your data set to OMOP. And I'll, I'll be really interested in this because that's one of the things that I'm working on at the moment. Um, and uh, there's a suite of open source tools that you can use with OMOP, but I'm really interested in the best way of utilizing the, those tools and the most efficient way of mapping the data so it's not too time consuming. So you can get onto the fun bits that uh, Nicole just talked about. 
Um, just on that as well, um, we talked about the Eden Academy at the last webinar. That's now live. So if you go to the Odyssey Australia website, there's a direct link to the uh, um, Eden Academy. And on there, there's tutorials on how to use all the open source Odyssey tools like Isagi and White Rabbit. Anyway, um, have we any questions for Dougie and Nicole? Uh, and if you've got a question, maybe just unmute and we'll see how that works and uh, let's have some questions. So there's a, a question from Michael on the chat um, who's asking if it's possible to get a copy of the slides and yeah, of course. Sorry, it's not, it's not such a, a great oh. direct question. It, yeah, that's why I typed it there. It's not a question on the, on the, on the great talk. I oh, just, okay. it'd be really handy for me to have that slide deck. Yeah, I yeah I was going to, yep, they'll, they'll all be available on the Odyssey Australia um, website and we've recorded this seminar as well. So, um, you can have that as well. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? I thought uh, what I might do then is uh, just um, mention that, that we've got the Odyssey Annual Symposium coming up in, on October 2020 as well. Uh, so look out for this one. Um, uh, so I think that that's going to be very exciting. Uh, um, I'm sure there's just going to be a huge number of workshops and things that we can learn uh, from that um, uh, to really help drive us, uh, drive us forward in Australia. And um, lastly, I've got some, uh, just some links that are here. Uh, so one of the most exciting ones really is the Eden Academy. Um, I don't know if we've got Nigel Hughes here with us uh, this evening from uh, from Eden, um, but the exciting thing about this is this is um, a, um, a huge initiative um, in Europe, Eden, and particularly around making um, training materials available for all aspects of, of mapping and using OMOP. And again, this is just one of the wonderful things that we can get from um, um, going down a route where we're working as part of a large international community because all of these tools are available to us. Um, so if anyone's really interested, that's where to go if you want to find out how to do this stuff. Okay, thanks Dougie. Um, mm -hmm. Any further questions? I, I think it's approaching six o'clock uh, in Melbourne and it's raining, so uh, may, maybe people are keen to get home, Dougie. Uh, hey, one final call for any questions and uh, that, then we can wrap this up. Okay, well, thanks very much, Dougie and Nicole. And oh, Roger, sorry ah, to Ty, jump in. Ty. Uh, yeah. It looks like Peter Pavlik has a question in the chat screen. Oh yes, sorry, I missed that. Uh, okay, from Peter. Um, can your model work with data using SNOMAD CT language? Ah, it's an interesting question. And um, Nicole, you probably best answer that. The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes. Um, Tang, did, did you want to talk actually about that? I mean, you probably... He's answered yes. I think I could say something yeah, about Yeah, go this. ahead. <laughs> uh, basically, the OMOP model uses SNOMAD CT for conditions. Yeah. Yes, uh, I guess the answer is yes. yes. And it's no without a W. <laughs> now. <laughs> it's a, uh, one of the beauties about Odyssey is that it's, there's a huge set of terminology that the international community has actually contributed with mappings and so on. So, you know, uh, that's a lot of efficiencies. Yeah, and the data, so when you actually convert the data into the OMOP common data model, it is actually SNOMED CT that it uses. Um, so yeah, so that's the final format, um, which is great for us in Australia in particular, because that is the standard that we're trying to push. Uh, so yeah, it's really good. And in response to John Goschok, yeah, yes, I had a question um, about, I mean, Australian yes. Medicine's terminology, which is a subset of um, SNOMED CTAU, is yeah. um, certainly growing uh, in use. 
and um, to describe medicines, you know, the terminology for medicines. And I was just wondering how you might use or plan to use uh, uh, the Australian medicines terminology. Yeah, so there is actually a mapping between AMT and RX norm, which is used in SNOMED. So if your data is in AMT, there is a conversion. Yeah. Oh. And um, the other thing is that, like, I think probably with the next talk, there are lots of uh, conventions and formalisms used apart from the standard concept that you need to be aware of. We've actually done a, a bit of a mapping between AMT and PBS and SNOMED, um, you know, we're using the ATC codes and found some, you have to be aware of it to work out to and deal with the, some of the idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, right at the moment in the last two days, I suppose, and there's been quite a discussion on the forums, the Odyssey forums about the mapping of um, ICD-10 Australian specific codes to um, OMOP and, and vice versa. So um, there's certainly a community um, and some discussion going on around um, medication um, mapping for Australia um, and I'd encourage anybody who's so interested in and looking at doing mapping of medicines in Australia to really jump on the forums um, and be part of that discussion and really I mean it is what we need to do in Australia we do have you know certain uh, things in Australia that are different than elsewhere and I think having the Odyssey Australia community will help us to really um, push that forward uh, and work out how it, how do we best manage our vocab here in, in Australia to, to participate in international studies and do our own uh, studies of interest uh, here in Australia. So if anybody's interested in um, the forums, just jump on to odyssey.org uh, and, you know, sign up uh, to the vocab um, forum and, and you can see all that discussion. So. Nicole, I've got one final question from Michael Lawley, uh, CSIRO. Um, at what level is the mapping, generic product or substance? Uh, we're talking about the drugs here. Yeah, well, I mean, it all depends um, what you want to map to. I, I don't know, Ty, perhaps you're the, the best person. Ty's been doing an exercise at the moment um, on medication mapping. Um, Ty, did you want to? Yeah, um, so Michael Lawley's question has come after John Gott's chalk. Um, so his question was, what about support for the Australian Medicines Terminology, which is a subset of SNOMED, C-T-A-U. Um, so we've actually been working with that. So there's mappings within the Odyssey databases to go from AMT to RX norm extension. Um, and so that that's all fine. There's some manual matching that needs to go on. It's not a perfect capture of everything that goes from AMT uh, to RX norm extension um, and the level of the mapping is whatever level you want to make it as far as I can tell. Um, we're using PBS item codes so it's not particularly granular um, but if you had any questions please you can email and we can work that out. Excellent. Thanks, Ty. Um, so I, I, I think we'll wrap it up at that because we're, we're past six o'clock in Melbourne. Um, just to let you know, uh, the session has been recorded. I'll put it up on the Odyssey Australia website along with the slides of the session. So thanks, everybody, for um, coming along this evening. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you again at another Odyssey Australia webinar. Thank you, everybody. Excellent. Thanks, thanks everyone. everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.